The date is April 5th, 2009. I'm two years and three months old. Marquez has just uploaded his tutorial on using Internet Explorer 8. Carrie Underwood and Brad Paisley have just won the 44th Country Music Awards. And Nintendo has just launched the Nintendo DSi in North America. Now it's 2024, and while no one should be using Internet Explorer 8 anymore, the Nintendo DSi still holds a spot in my heart as one of my favorite Nintendo handhelds of all time. So today we're going back 15 years to revisit the cooler, younger cousin of the Nintendo DS Lite and Nintendo DS and answer the question of whether it's still worth picking one up in 2024 and beyond. Let's get into it. As a celebration for the growth of the channel recently, I went ahead and bought a complete in-box Nintendo DSi to get the unboxing experience that I A, never had, B, would not have been able to remember, C, would not have recorded, D, would not have had the camera to record, because I was two. I'm gonna keep hammering that point in just to make all of you feel old, particularly you guys in the 18 to 34 demographic. I see you. Inside the box, you've got the DSi itself, a stylus, about five instructional booklets that are a lot of fun to go through in the modern era. Oh look, there's how Apple could have avoided every battery controversy. Along with the, at the time, brand new proprietary charger. Having to find the DSi charger in the modern era just makes me appreciate USB-C so much more. And it really gets more tempting every day to put USB-C in my 3DS, which is my daily driver. Uh, subscribe if you want to see me attempt that. If that ever happens, it's going to be in like a year. I want to also really quickly give a shout out to the guy on eBay who sold me the inbox DSi because it is in amazing condition. The box isn't sealed, that would have, I would have needed a few more years on YouTube to afford that. But the box, like it still had the tape on it, everything was still wrapped in the plastic and everything, it was just great condition. It looked like the books hadn't even been opened and aside from the bottom screen, the, the system itself is in excellent condition. Setting up the device is pretty simple and with lack of better word, somewhat whimsical. You set the time, pick a name, write a short bio, pick your favorite color and that's it. It's beautiful seeing a setup screen that doesn't have 12 privacy toggles and a required internet connection and a mandatory account sign in and privacy policy. None of that. It's a lot of fun. And I honestly wish more devices asked me what my favorite color was. It's purple. There is networking on this device, but the standard DS games like Mario Kart DS just don't support modern encryption standards like WPA2, so they won't work. If the DSi connects to your home network first try, you've probably got a really serious networking problem. You can connect the DSi to modern networks, but only for DSi functionality, and you'll need to dig into the advanced networking setup. By the way, all those servers are dead now, so you're not gonna be doing much with that anyway, unless you spin up WIMFI or whatever it's called. The UI on the DSi is one of the first and biggest changes you'll notice from previous systems in the DS line, which at this point were the DS and the DS Lite. And you'll even immediately see the remnants of the DSi design language that linger in modern Nintendo consoles. And by that, I mean that the Switch home screen is conceptually the exact same. At the time, it had a similar design language to the Nintendo Wii, making it a perfect portable partner for the popular paraphernalia. I'm not sure what I was cooking when I wrote that line. I still think that even today, the software on the DSi is holding up spectacularly well. It's fast, intuitive, simple, and it gets the job done. I really wish Microsoft would take a page out of Nintendo's book there. Despite the simplicity of the DSi OS, it's still packed with software and fun features that would keep you occupied for hours, even without having a single game. Flipnote Studio, PictoChat, the web browser, DSi Sound, and the camera were all made to fit perfectly alongside the clean yet quirky design language of the DSi. And Flipnote particularly is still making huge waves in modern internet culture with creators like That's Just Scrump and Aurora XD. Let's go gambling! Aw oh, dang it! Aw oh, dang it! Aw oh, dang it! Hell, ask anyone who grew up with the DSi about that camera app and you'll have hundreds of nostalgic tales about messing with the filters and drawing on photos and just everything that that app had to offer. These pieces of functionality had immense replayability and basically cemented the DSi into the memories of everyone who grew up with one. Even more so, I'd say, than the 3DS that came after it. The only thing that took from the DSi camera was the graffiti feature, which is, it's not that much compared to what the DSi had. Although I guess that the 3DS did add 3D photos, so I don't know, take that Apple. The, DS, the DSi did not ha have, have the graffiti. Jack, do you have anything you'd, you'd like to say? He did lie. 
Thanks, Jack. And I guess video as well, but that's no fun. I also do want to give a shout out to the nostalgia behind Picto Chat, although that was a DS feature, not really a DSi feature. And it should have been on the 3DS. I know they had Swap Note, but it wasn't the same. The DSi was also the first Nintendo handheld to include downloadable games from the DSi shop. You couldn't purchase actual DS games here, like things like Mario Kart DS when you Super Mario Brothers. They were still limited to cartridges, likely because of the slower average internet connections at the time and because of the extremely limited internal storage, which I'll get into later. Instead, you'd be downloading DSiWare, games that were made for the DSi and sold exclusively exclusively on the DSi shop. These were fairly consistent in price, ranging from free to a thousand DSi points, or around 10 US dollars, not accounting for inflation. And while the shop did have its fair share of shovelware, there are some great titles here. Frodo Dojo, Mario vs Donkey Kong Minis March Again, Dark Void Zero, the mini clubhouse game titles, and many more. You can't buy these titles today, unfortunately. They became impossible to legally acquire when the 3DS eShop shut down in 2023, and you stop being able to buy them on the DSi itself when that store shut down in March of 2017. That's almost six years ago, by the way, just making you feel as old as possible here. You can still get them, I'm just not gonna tell you where. <laughs> The great thing about DSiWare was the ability for it to take advantage of the much richer feature set of the Nintendo DSi, like the cameras and the improved performance, and the networking. Like how Photo Dojo used those cameras to put you and your friends into the game, that was really cool. The other benefit of DSiWare was the fairly affordable pricing compared to standard DS games at the time, which were usually around 30 to 35 US dollars. Which is really funny, <laughs> considering that most games are 60 US, or even potentially 70 US now. Although 35 US dollars in 2004, is around 60 today, so. The hardware on the DSi, like the software, was honestly ahead of its time and still holds up in the modern era. Compared to the DS Lite, it's four grams lighter and 2.6 millimeters thinner on the that way, and has a much more premium feeling matte finish on the exterior. The DSi did unfortunately axe the GBA slot, removing backwards compatibility with those games unless you install custom firmware, which again, I'll get into that later. But in its place are, among other things, the cameras, two VGA 0.3 megapixel cameras on the lid and on the hinge, which let's be real, they were terrible. The latest iPhone at the time, the iPhone 3GS, had a three megapixel main camera compared to the one on the DSi. The DSi also didn't have autofocus, stabilization, auto wire balance, or any of those other fancy camera features that we're used to. And for the cherry on top, there's no video support. You had to wait till the 3DS for that. The real source of the DSi camera was the software I mentioned earlier. And honestly, the DSi camera objectively looks but subjectively, it's just got a I just like how it looks. It, it's got like a vibe. It's taking photos with this camera is like applying those, the rose tinted nostalgia glasses that everyone talks about. It's like applying those to the modern world. And it's really just kind of, kind of jar, it's weird. The, the 480p resolution just gives me comfort, honestly. The DSi brought other hardware additions as well, like an SD card slot and volume buttons on the side instead of the slider. As far as I can tell, this is the only DS system that does this and honestly, I kind of prefer it. <laughs> it is a bit annoying not knowing what volume my system is going to play the dun of the DS startup screen when I turn it on. But what you get for that gamble is possibly one of my favorite features, which is system wide brightness control, which is just a great feature. On the 3DS, this isn't much of an issue. Just get Luma 3DS and you've got Rosalie in a menu and that has brightness controls there. But it was really nice to have that in the stock firmware. In terms of raw hardware, the DSi is still wildly underpowered compared to even the PSP, which launched in 2004. I've never lived in a world without the PSP. Isn't that wild? Feel old. <laughs> The DSi included a whopping 16 megabytes of RAM and somehow managed to run a web browser off of it, a 256 by 192 screen, and two ARM CPUs. An ARM 9 chip clocked at 133 megahertz, and an ARM 7 clocked at 33 megahertz. The system included 256 megabytes of internal storage and officially allowed for up to 32 gigabytes to be used in the SD card slot. We know now that you can use much larger SD cards there, they just have to be formatted correctly. 32 gigs is probably enough for most people. My system with custom firmware has 64 gigs in there and it's going just fine. Even with my fairly large game library, I've still got plenty of storage left. So 32 gigs is probably a decent, decent balance. The hardware here is an upgrade from the DS Lite, as you'd expect. On top of the DS Lite not having the SD card slot, cameras and other features, the ARM9 in the DS Lite was clocked to only be about half the speed of the DSi. It only included four megabytes of RAM and had 256 kilobytes of flash memory only for the OS. The PSP, which again, 
same year as the DS, smashed both of those out of the water, including a 222 to 333 megahertz processor, depending on what model you had, at least 32 megabytes of RAM, 16 gigabytes of flash storage, and a 480 by 272 screen, along with an actual GPU that rendered at 2.6 gigaflops and a networking system that still connects to modern networks. While the DSi doesn't have a GBA slot, the hardware for it still exists to run those games, as far as I can gather from various documentations I've seen, and can be accessed to run GBA ROMs via GBA Runner 2, which I'll get into later. Unfortunately, that thinner form factor and higher performance did lead to a hit in battery life compared to the DS Lite. The DSi was tested at launch to get 9 to 14 hours of gameplay on the lowest brightness compared to the 15 to 19 hours that would be clocked on the DS Lite. That's also probably a lot to do with the physical size of the battery. It was 160 milliamp hours smaller than the DS Lite, coming in at 840 milliamp hours. At least the DS had easily replaceable batteries. And that performance is almost certainly going to be degraded in modern systems compared to what it was when it was brand new. Although personally, I never really have had a problem with DS battery life. I'm gonna, I haven't turned this on in months because I've been using the 3DS and it's still going just fine. If you, I guarantee if you have a DS somewhere, like an original, if you go turn it on, it's going to turn on as if nothing happened. Now, considering that developers basically launch games specifically for the DSi, that doesn't really make much sense, but the Nintendo Switch, developers are trying to cram full home console games onto a handheld and it resulted in ports like Ark Survival Evolved and Hogwarts Legacy being terrible and not really working. But these games were made for the DSi. The specs in there run those games perfectly today. The higher specs on the DSi mainly opened the doors for extra features in already existing DS games. There weren't really many DSi exclusives as far as I could tell. That extra performance also added more performance obviously, for homebrew developers to take advantage of, mainly for things like emulation. However, most of the emulators that run on the DS are very, very well optimized by this point, and there's not really much of a difference between what you can emulate on the DSi and on the Nintendo DS. The limits of the DS and DSi are mainly SNES on the home console side and GBA on the handheld side, although that's not really emulating, but you get the idea. The build quality on this system still feels really nice. Despite the thinner build, it still feels about as durable as your average DS Lite, and theoretically, there's no like moving parts here, so it should be more durable. The face buttons and D-pad on the DSi are also clicky now, instead of the rubber membranes that we used on the DS Lite, and more like the buttons that were used on the original DS before it. And that trend continues for literally every other Nintendo handheld system right up until the Switch Lite. Maybe the original 3DS doesn't. I'm not 100% sure on that. I don't think it has rubber buttons, but I could be wrong. Overall, the hardware from the DSi still absolutely holds up today, especially in comparison to the OG DS and even the DS Lite, honestly. Although the 3DS, particularly those in the new 3DS lineup, like this one here, really honed in and just perfected that design that was established on the DSi. And this, I really love this design way more. <laughs> But the DSi is still really nice. And the DSi is also even a bit thinner than the 3DS system, which I really appreciate. But there's no point in having all of that hardware if there aren't any games to back it up. Luckily for Nintendo, the DS has one of the most critically acclaimed and best game catalogs on a handheld probably ever. And the DSi, not being a completely new generation system, was able to just piggyback off of the library that was already established on the DS, while also adding those DSiWare titles that just makes it a great catalogue. It does ditch the GBA, which is a real shame, because that had some excellent games as well, but the DS and DSi library is very well established. Particularly the DS one at this point was had a lot of games. The, with the bundled apps in the DSiWare and the DS games, it's probably one of the most extensive handheld libraries bar maybe the 3DS and the Switch. And the Switch doesn't even have flip notes, so I don't know if we can even count it here. There were so many classics on this system. Mario Kart DS is even still today rated only one point off of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe on Metacritic. New Super Mario Brothers was the first new Super Mario game, and it faithfully recreated basically everything that made Mario Mario and added more functionality, and it was just such a great title. It's probably one of Probably one of the best New Super Mario Bros. games, apart from maybe New Super Mario Bros. Wii. Rhythm Heaven was a beautifully designed and adorable rhythm game that really took advantage of that DS hardware. And it's a, it's a that, again, is starting to make rounds in modern internet culture again, thanks to Heaven Studio, which was a custom level builder based around the Rhythm Heaven minigames. It's just big me. I'm really like that, and your best 
The DS did have its fair share of shovelware, probably more so than almost all of the other consoles at the time. And that shovelware did make its way into DSiWare as well, but the amount of high quality games that exist on the system easily outweighs all the shovelware. And almost all of the great games on the system took that dual screen gimmick and just ran with it to add even more functionality to those titles. Mario Kart DS used the bottom screen to get the minimap off the main screen. Rhythm Heaven took advantage of the touch screen to play the game with control methods that just wouldn't have been possible with buttons, and Flip Note genuinely could not have existed without that touch screen. Like I mentioned, the DSi had all of those titles and even more. Traditional DS games could launch with DSi enhanced features, like Pokemon Black, White, and their sequel equals being able to use the enhanced internet connection on their online features and being able to use the cameras when you're in the X transceiver. I never played Pokemon, I don't know what that is. And that doesn't even, like I cannot understate the amount of content that was added in the DSi shop. Unfortunately, the DSi shop and a lot of those internet connected features just aren't available anymore. And the DSi, obviously, no longer gets any form of software updates or support from Nintendo. Luckily, that makes it really, really easy to mod. You might think that the best way to start running Homebrew on the DSi is with a traditional flash card. Like, where is it? Like this one, the R4 Gold. However, that's far from the best way to do it nowadays. The DSi was Nintendo's first handheld to be able to update over the internet, and Nintendo was using that to crack down on flashcards, but every time a new update pushed to block them, the flashcard manufacturers were straight in there with an update that got around those blocks. At this point, again, Nintendo doesn't give a shit about the system, so most normal flashcards with up-to-date firmware are going to work just fine on the DSi. However, installing full custom firmware and something like Twilight Menu on the system is going to give you way more flexibility and just so many more things you can do. Running custom firmware is dead simple and usually takes her only around 15 to 20 minutes to get set up. All you'll need is an SD card. I'd recommend about 32 to 64 gigs for larger game libraries. And you'll also need a computer. I'm not going to detail how to install it in this video and a general rule of thumb within the homebrew community is to avoid video guides if you can. Unlike text guides, they can't be updated to show new methods or things you should avoid if, you know, issues come up or Nintendo decides to wake up and update the system for some reason. They have done that with the 3DS in the past, so it's not an entirely impossible thing that could happen. This isn't as big of a problem on the DSi as it is on the 3DS, for example. Like just on that system, a few weeks ago, a new method dropped that literally just involves, I think I think it was a few months, but it literally, you just click a link and press mod, and if the files are on your SD card, it takes like, five minutes from there. The DSi seems to be more set in stone with those custom firmware methods, but I'd still recommend using dsi.hacks.guide as your only source for installing custom firmware on your system. If you want a video guide, if you're a visual learner or you just feel more comfortable doing it that way, I'd recommend pulling up a video guide alongside the website, and then if any conflicts arise between the two methods, stick with the website. If you follow the DSi hacks guide documentation exactly, you should have a DSi that boots straight into Twilight Menu off the SD card in the system. Once you're there, you can drop DS ROMs into the correct folders, just like a flashcard, but you can also drop retro game ROMs like NES, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, and they boot up without any emulator configuration or any fuss, really. You can also run, I believe, DSiWare titles that wouldn't run off a standard DS mode flashcard. The main benefits to using Twilight Menu aside from DSiWare and the other retro systems is the auto boot and the clean UI. Twilight Menu also doesn't have a time bomb like a lot of other modern flashcards do, which would stop it from working after a certain date, forcing you to go buy a new one, or just turning the time back on your DS. In the modern era, custom firmware on this system is an absolute necessity. Considering that the DS used game market is particularly expensive, especially Pokemon games for some reason, and most of the online services for these games are closed down, it's definitely worth the few minutes you'll need to spend to get it up and running. And while you could use a flash card, it's a lot easier to find an SD card nowadays. I, If you can find one like physical store that is going to sell you an R4 Gold, I will give you 10 bucks. <laughs> I, I won't, don't don't quote me on that. And you, besides, you'd need an SD card for a flash card anyway, so you, you may as well just get an SD card and save you money. And Twilight Menu is going to provide you with a much better experience than most flash cards will give you anyway. If for any reason you still want a flash card, like you use multiple systems or you have a DS Lite and you just like the sound of Twilight Menu, you can install it on a flash card. Guides for a lot of the most popular flash cards are available on the Twilight Menu wiki. And you know, if you're in the market for one, I'd highly recommend shopping from that list and then installing Twilight Menu onto it. If you don't plan on using multiple systems, again, just install it on the system. It's a lot easier, it's quicker, and you'll 
it's cheaper. You're, I guarantee you're more likely to have an SD card lying around compared to an R4. And also, by the way, if you like the sounds of Twilight Menu, but you're on a 3DS, you can install it there as well for a better DS game experience. Now, around two years after the launch of the DSi came the DSi XL, a larger model of the system with a glossy finish and some not as vibrant color schemes. I don't remember who said it, but someone at Nintendo said that it was meant to be shared and kept in one central location, as opposed to the standard DS, which would be more personal. I did own a DSi XL, but the top screen fell off. So there isn't much to say about the DSi XL. The main benefit in you know the current modern era is that it is the basically the definitive way to play DS games on a larger screen. The 3DS XL does exist, and I've gone up there, but it's not an exact resolution scale to the DS, unlike the DSi XL was. So if you're a real perfectionist and purist about things like that, the DSi XL is definitely the way to go to play DS games on a larger screen. Now, talking about the pricing of retro systems is very difficult, considering I'm basing this entirely off the used market. Nintendo obviously doesn't sell new DSi's anymore, so you know that's my only option. Before I go into this, consider that the pricing may have fluctuated up or down into the future, and I'm going off eBay sold prices that are in the Australian market for this. So Again, speaking in Australian dollars, I'm going to be putting US dollar conversions up on the screen that are accurate as of when I edited this video. I bought the DSi up there, the complete inbox one, for around 140 bucks. But that is far from the cheapest DSi you can get. I bought another DSi the day before, which is the one I've been holding up to you, this one with the Twitter check mark. And I bought that for 50 bucks plus shipping, and it is in excellent condition. That one didn't come with any accessories or anything, but it's it, it looks really nice and it's pretty good. When I looked it up, I'm seeing sold listings go from anywhere between 35 to 200 dollars, depending on the condition, the accessories, the bundled games, standard or XL, and a ton of other factors. You'll definitely want to scour a little bit around the market. Maybe places like Facebook Marketplace or OfferUp in the US might be able to get you a better deal. Even in 2024, I still recommend the DSi as an excellent handheld system. But there are a few things you might want to consider. First off, if you don't mind the older design... Where was I? Ah, the DS. So again, if you don't mind the older design and playing non-DSi games, a DS Lite might be a better option. But those prices are shockingly similar on eBay. You might be able to get it for cheaper on Marketplace or OfferUp. If, if you're finding DS Lites are the exact same price as a DSi, go for the DSi, unless you want to play GBA cartridges. You might also want to consider something from the 3DS era if you want to spend a little bit more. Th that'll just add a lot more flexibility to your game library, along with DS, DSi, where GBA and all of those, the systems that they can emulate, you'll also have the entire 3DS library, along with even more emulation, especially on those new 3DS systems. You'll have thousands more games, Mario Kart 7, Super Smash Bros 3DS, Bravely Default, Bravely Second, Terraria, I think Minecraft, and you'll be able to emulate N64, PS1, and other systems on the new 3DS at least. The new 3DS, the non-XL model that I showed you earlier is my personal daily driver and I love this thing. However, these systems are considerably more expensive. I'm seeing them on eBay go anywhere from around $120 to $380, depending on factors like size, standard or new and other things. And those are the reasonable prices, the things that you'd actually buy. This Animal Crossing limited edition uh, complete in box system sold for $1,000 and they didn't even include shipping. The DSi is an excellent option that strikes a nice balance between performance, game library, and affordability. And it has one of my favorite designs in the DS lineup, even compared to my daily driver. If you're in the market for a DS, whether you're buying something to daily drive or you're adding to a collection, the DSi gets my recommendation in 2024 and beyond. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this blast of the past and hopefully I didn't make you feel too old. You can follow me over on Instagram, threads, and everything else with the links on screen and in the description below. If you like that video, you know a button to hit. And if you really like that video, maybe even hit subscribe. If you want more videos, you can click over here to check out my review of the M2 MacBook Air, a slightly more modern system. And you can click over here to check out my handheld collection as of last year. That's a good video. I like that one. So is this one. Watch both of them. Why not? Thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys next time.